Well, hi, everybody. I see that it's seven o'clock right on the hour. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Advanced Level 2 Natural Areas Management Services webinar series. Um, this week, this first week is Wildlife Week this week. So we're glad that you can join us and we hope that uh, you saw last week's session, if my slides want to advance, or not last week, Tuesday's session. So last week we talked about uh, creating and enhancing wildlife habitat. And this week, we're gonna have Jim Parkhurst uh, talk to us about addressing wildlife con conflicts, dealing with uninvited guests. So addressing those wildlife contacts. So attracting wildlife has beneficial results for wild, attracting wildlife has beneficial results for some wildlife that is highly desirable. However, it can also attract wildlife that becomes a problem and creates human wildlife conflicts. Deers, snakes, squirrels, and other species can become a nuisance. This presentation will focus on how to mitigate these conflicts so that your clients can enjoy their property. So we're glad that you can uh, join us tonight. We have a few housekeeping items. My name's Agnes Kedmanet. Thank you for joining us. Um, and you may recognize my colleague from Tuesday, Andrew Kling. Uh, we are your hosts for this evening. Uh, well, I'm your host for this evening, and we have Andrew in the background with a couple of our other um, Woods in Your Backyard partnership fellows in the background here, going to answer some of your questions. So we thank you for registering today. Some of the benefits include uh, these learning opportunities, connecting with other professionals. Um, and that was one of the things that I had said that um, we are a really active bunch in our chats and our questions. and. Uh, Trading trade secrets, sharing trade secrets has been uh, great. So as you'll notice, all participants are muted and the video is shut off. You'll see that Agnes, me and Jim have our video going, but all the other participants have their video shut off. Um, this uh, webinar is gonna be recorded and it's available through our website there, extension at umd.edu slash woodland. What also will happen is that you'll receive an email that will have um, this webinar recording in it and perhaps some other resources as we move forward. Yes, yes, you will be getting some continuing education credits for this. We are pleased that International Society of Arboriculture, Society of American Foresters, licensed tree experts here in Maryland, and many more um, are willing to uh, use this program as continuing education credits. So what will happen is you will get emailed a certificate. And once you get emailed that certificate, please send it to the appropriate um, association that you would like that continuing education credit for. So once you get that certificate emailed to you, please take the time to email that so you get the credits that you're working towards tonight. So if you have any questions, and we hope you do, uh, we encourage those questions and we'd ask that you put them in the Q&A uh, button. It's at the bottom of your screen there. You can see it has those two bubbles with the Q&A in it. We're gonna hold those questions till the end of the discussion. So Jim will do his presentation and um, Jim and I will go through those questions together. That chat box is a really great feature because that's where you can share your tips and tricks and maybe some of your um, fun comments about woodchucks or, or poss uh, possums or whatever you'd like. But questions uh, will go in the Q&A button. And as I mentioned, we have some of the woods in your backyard professionals in the background here, and they may come in and answer some of those questions and participate in that. So we, uh, we appreciate you using those two features. So an evaluation for this webinar will be sent out within a week of the final session and your feedback is very important. Um, feedback we receive then forms other trainings that we may want to offer when we hear a need or we hear your interest. So we appreciate your feedback for sure. So without further ado, today's speaker is Jim Parkhurst. Jim Parkhurst is the Associate Professor of Wildlife Conservation in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife Conservation. And he's also an Extension Wildlife Specialist with, with, with Virginia Cooperative Extension at Virginia Tech. 
He has a bachelor's of science in wildlife biology from University of Massachusetts, wetland and wildlife ecology masters from University of Rhode Island, and from Pennsylvania State University, he got his PhD in forest resources. Some of the things that he's involved in is a 10 year statewide species management policies and plans for uh, white-tailed deer. He develops uh, policy documents regarding the management of wildlife management areas and public voting and water access. And he also helps with the revision of uh, the policy regarding hunting hounds in Virginia. So this fella is the fellow we want to hear tonight. So Jim, welcome. We appreciate that you're here. And um, without further ado, I'll stop sharing my screen. And if you want to hop on board and share yours, uh, feel free to go right ahead. And I'll see you uh, when you're done your presentation. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Well, good evening, folks. It's a pleasure to be here and to share some time with you on a topic that uh, actually probably encompasses about 80% of my time in, in present time. So a little roadmap to where I would like to go tonight, sort of guide our, our thinking. Uh, first and foremost, I want to take sort of a sidebar and just talk in some generalities about the legalities that come into play here. Uh, there's a lot of regulation out there. It's highly variable from state to state. And it's important that before anybody does anything, they know what's going on in terms of the law. So I'm gonna highlight a few pieces of, of regulatory area that I know are gonna be problematic in a lot of cases. But then I wanna take a kind of a, a step back. I know the discussion on Tuesday night was about how we uh, go about or the kinds of techniques that we can use to enhance wildlife. Uh, and a lot of those principles are covered in the, the handbooks but I wanna re-examine them from the perspective of, can we use a lot of that same information to our advantage when we're faced with dealing with conflicts? And the hope is that there's opportunity there to still fulfill a lot of our desired goals for wildlife, but to try to minimize the negative interactions that inevitably will come up. So let's talk a little bit about the technical legalities here. And we're speaking about regulations, uh, ordinances, statutes that are on the books. And the areas that I wanna focus on is again, there's a lot of them here, but three areas where issues always seem to come up. And one of those deals with proper pesticide regulatory um, following regulations. Uh, those that pertain to the capture and handling of wildlife, and then some general concerns dealing with lethal methodologies. Now, in the area of conflict resolution, the, the role of pesticides comes up usually in two areas, that of the use of repellents and toxicants or, or poisons doesn't matter which, um, but both of those realms are covered under the FIFRA regulations. Um, that's the, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. And the concerns here are, are multiple. Any products that are used have to be registered, both at the federal level through the EPA, but also through the state. And very often that's gonna be through the State Department of Agriculture. Uh, but we're only allowed to use registered products. Anybody who is applying these materials must have in possession the appropriate level of certification, uh, general applicator, and then there's very specific advanced certifications. Much of the work that I find myself dealing with does require higher level certification. A lot of the products are going to be restricted use. And then 
sort of a, a no-brainer here, but we find a lot of, of uh, violation going on, is that any of the products that are used must be following the label directions. Uh, anything that is termed off-label is going to get you into some pretty hot water quickly. And when we start looking at repellents and toxicants, why this becomes so tricky is that their use and the registrations are specific to both animal and species of animal and the location in which it can or cannot be used. So simply because there are products that are registered for deer, let's say, doesn't mean you can use them in all applications or areas where you might want to. And certainly uh, home remedies are totally off the table. Now looking at trapping and handling of wildlife, this is one of those cases where claiming ignorance of the law doesn't get you any freebies. Uh, the burden of knowing the law and following the law falls entirely upon the affected party, and usually that's the landowner, or upon the individuals that they may be hiring who can perform the work that they either aren't capable of doing or would prefer to have somebody help them do that. And so in some regards, this does fall on folks in our audience tonight. Um, you are responsible for knowing what the law does or does not allow you to do. And just in some, venera, some general terms here, um, some of the areas where people get into some trouble here, uh, these are activities that are typically prohibited. So any, any take, any capture or killing of wild animals for which there is not an open season would be deemed illegal. Now, some species never have an open season. Anything that falls within the non-game category is never open for take. Out of season simply references those species that would be classified as being a game species or a trappable species, but it's the wrong time of year. The season has been closed. So we do need to pay attention to those um, aspects. But then there's the trifecta, which a lot of people get hung up on. The possession of a wild animal, the transportation of a wild animal, or liberation of a wild animal typically are all illegal unless you have a permit in your possession. And typically that's going to come from either a, a game warden or a conservation police officer in your state. So we've got a lot of cases going on where people are catching animals and doing things with them without the necessary uh, authorizations to do so. And uh, there's quite a few citations floating around. <clears throat> now I wanna just give you a quick sort of example. And I'm gonna use Virginia in this particular case because that's what I deal with on a regular basis. But here in Virginia, we have existing provisions in our code, the Code of Virginia, that grants a landowner the right to trap an animal that is causing damage to their property or person. Now, there are some limitations on that. Not all animals are, are in this, uh, but it's pretty wide and, and flexible uh, authority that is granted to landowners to protect their properties. What the code doesn't address <clears throat> is what do you do with any animals that you do capture and particularly live animals. That's not in the code. It's buried in other regulations. And this is where it becomes difficult to know all of this stuff. But this is probably one of the best kept secrets here in Virginia. 
because it gets into what's called allowable disposition. Now, how do we interpret that? Well, in Virginia, if you catch an animal, if you've got damage and you put out a, a live capture device, a box trap of some sort, and you catch an animal, what do you do with it? What does the law allow you to do? Well, we have only three options. The first one is that you must release that animal at the point of capture. That one always stymies people. Why would I do that? I just spent a lot of time trying to catch that bugger. Well, what it means is you have the right to release that animal only on property that you own. Okay, you cannot remove it from your property. That surprises a lot of people. Your second option is if for some reason that animal is displaying some kind of a injury or some ailment, something that you believe it requires some treatment for, you are allowed to transport that animal to a wildlife rehabilitation facility but only if you call ahead and the facility that you're trying to take it to agrees to accept it. So you can't put this thing in the back of the vehicle and drive to the nearest vet clinic and think that they're gonna take it, okay? You would probably be in jeopardy if a, a game warden were to stop you on the road. The third and last option is that animal must be put down. So here in Virginia, you have no option for trap, transfer, and release. That is illegal in Virginia. You cannot do it. So you can't take an animal from your property and put it on property that you do not own. And that includes things like the National Forest, other public lands, uh, heaven forbid, a neighbor's land, um, that's just not an option. And so if you're gonna take on trapping, you'd better be ready and capable of performing the euthanasia. And this applies to anybody that you hire as well. All of the private sector operators are under the very same regulations. They have a caveat though, that they can put an animal in a trap in the back of the truck and drive off the property. A lot of times they will take it back to their operational headquarters and perform the euthanasia there so that the client doesn't have to witness uh, having to put that animal down but they will lose their license to operate if they were to take that animal and release it somewhere other than where they caught it. So this gets tricky. Now, not all states do this. Some states do allow for the transport and release of animals, uh, but the numbers of those states remaining is dwindling, uh, primarily for concern about the, the animal, humaneness, uh, spread of disease, uh, a lot of factors. Uh, so I envision that we're gonna see stricter and stricter regulations coming into play here uh, in the future. The last thing with the technical pieces <clears throat> is just some thinking about lethal methodology in general. When we're working with clients, there is kind of an obligation for us to have a discussion with them that lethal options should really be considered methods of last resort. And for some of those cases that, we, that I had mentioned where the restriction comes into play, there actually has to be a demonstration made that you've tried other non-lethal approaches before consideration of a lethal technique would be um, brought to the fore. Now, there are some exceptions to that. There are some cases where we know that there really are no other options except for uh, lethal 
methods. <clears throat> but we do not want to have a client call us up and say, I want you to come and get rid of this animal. And it doesn't solve any problems. I know people do that. We have a lot of um, professionals that, that do this because it's a good way for repeat business in many cases. But simply removing an animal does not solve the problem. And those anim animals that you remove are gonna be very quickly be replaced by others that are sort of lurking in the backgrounds or in the surroundings. And the reason for this is that you have done absolutely nothing to solve why the problem arose in the first place. And unless you do that, this is gonna become the newest and somewhat expensive hobby for folks because these animals are gonna keep coming because the habitat and the conditions and the attractants that drew them there still remain. So we really need to have that conversation with clients that just simply removing or killing an animal is not a solution. It's gonna be repeated time and time and time again. Okay, enough with the technicalities here. I, it's important that we have that discussion though. It sets a stage for uh, some of the things that we'll be talking about later on. <clears throat> But right now I wanna move on and talk about the focus here of what do we do when wildlife shows up either where we don't want it or it involves species that we didn't think were gonna be here or don't want to be here. So, you know, looking back at some of the topics that probably came up on Tuesday, a lot of those things related to how do we attract wildlife? What can we do that makes things better for wildlife? So there was probably some discussion about edges of various types, uh, maybe some discussion about uh, you know, improvements to the habitat, such as creating appropriately the right type of brush piles. Maybe there was some discussion about food plots. Uh, these would not be unusual topics when you're talking about management strategies to promote wildlife. All of them really have kind of a, a basis behind them that we are trying to do things in the habitat to improve the conditions that will benefit wildlife. And so you've probably seen this time and time again here, but the theory is, you know, if you build it, they will come. And it is very, very true that if you create conditions that are attractive and provide for the needs of these animals, they're going to show up. The ones that you were hoping to attract and a lot of others as well. And so that's why having some understanding of some principles of, of what I would call wildlife and habitat ecology are so important to both enhancing the conditions and trying to promote favorable conditions, but equally so in going the other way. If you understand what attracts and what animals benefit from, those become the tools that you apply to try to reduce that attractiveness. Now, so often for simplicity's sake, when we start talking about all of these principles of, of wildlife management, we often do so and, and present them as sort of solitary or standalone concepts. Now, we do that just to expedite the presentation and understanding. But unfortunately, it oversimplifies things. And we have to recognize that all of these things are interrelated and interdependent. And there's this real intricate fabric out there that creates these conditions and promotes the sustainability. <clears throat> and so if we understand all of those connections and all the relationships Relationships. We can use that to our advantage to both promote 
and to solve conflicts. And so in this realm of where we're going to go tonight, then I need to sort of change the focus from where we were on Tuesday night to looking at a lot of those same principles, but from a different perspective. How do we achieve the good that we want to get to and not have to deal with so much of the bad? It's going to represent compromise. You can't have it both ways. Uh, and so it does mean modifying objectives, uh, maybe giving up or foregoing certain activities. Uh, and it's a determination that it requires some discussion with landowners on what their true objectives are and what they're willing to accept. <clears throat> Now, again, you may have seen something like this on Tuesday, uh, but it is very telling. Now, we know animals have to live someplace. And some appear to and seem to be able to live just about anywhere, but not all animals can do that. They have very specific requirements. And a lot of times when we have discussions with landowners, they say, well, I really want to have these animals here. Why can't I get them? Well, it reveals uh, some issues with not fully understanding a lot of these principles. And so we want to look at what really determines where animals live. Is it even possible to attract some of these things? Or in the negative sense, being able to answer why they're there. Now, both, uh, both of the handbooks that, that uh, were provided as part of this course, have some really good discussion of the four horsemen of, of life, or what we refer to as the critical necessities. Now, I don't want to get into all the details of, of what you do with these things, uh, but they are important areas to touch on when we're starting to develop and resolve some conflicts. Uh, so those four horsemen here, you know, food, cover or shelter, water and space, uh, you undoubtedly have seen these things and may have talked about this on Tuesday. Where all of these things come together is in the habitat and what we do with it. If it's a good quality habitat, then all of these needs are going to be met in some way or another. Now, from the conflict standpoint, we can look at these four horsemen, if you will, and decide what kinds of things can we do to the habitat that make these less viable, less available, to the point that we would be forcing animals to go elsewhere. So that's what I want to focus on for this next part. Now, I think all of us would recognize and say this looks like habitat, very typical for kind of a mid-Atlantic and northeastern uh, deciduous forest. Uh, lots of space and niches out there. Looks pretty good. This is habitat as well. Obviously different. It's going to attract and hold a very different suite of animals those that really require the early successional stages of development. But this is habitat as well. And as much as many landowners don't view their little pieces and parcels as being viable habitat, it is. And animals will use it. You don't need 200 acres. You can have a lot of activity on a half acre lot. And so we do need to convince landowners that that half acre or one acre lot has potential and is going to serve meeting the needs of wildlife. So let's look at a couple of these four horsemen, if you will, and how does food relate to what we're trying to do here? Now, if you were doing a good job in, in your sort of assessment of property and habitat potential. One of the first steps that's always talked about is you got to do an inventory. 
what have I got? What's meeting needs right now? What's missing? What would be something that I might want to uh, provide that is missing now or would enhance the effectiveness of, of my property? Now recognize that we do that from an enhancement stand, standpoint on those species that we want to try to attract and that would meet your objectives. But we also need to look at this from the perspective of those unintended ones. What is it that they rely on? What are they gonna be looking for? And so your inventory needs to be expanded, not just to those things that are the important ones from the landowner's perspective, but for whatever else might be in that area and would respond to enhancement activities. Now, one of the things I have also found is that when people are doing these inventories, they focus on what's on the ground right in front of them and, and what's right on the property. A lot of times we overlook what we would consider supplemental resources. You know, what are the alternative foods? If you've got agriculture near you, um, that's gonna represent potential for other resources. Maybe you've got somebody in the neighborhood who is feeding wildlife. That has to be taken into account uh, as you're making this inventory because that is gonna play into what wildlife actually are using and will benefit from. So in terms of conflict resolution and working on trying to limit the the effects of offending species here, we've got a couple of objectives that we can talk about that are related to food. If we identify useful resources, is there a way that we can reduce that availability or eliminate it outright? Okay, that can be a challenge because a lot of times the species that we're trying to promote also depend on those resources. So another approach would be, is there a way that we can restrict access of these unintended or offending species to gain, uh, gain access to those resources? And we'll talk about some ways that we might be able to do that. Now, there are some differences that become important and we, we need to talk about with animals. And again, this may be a little bit of, of review from, from the other night. I, again, I don't know. Uh, but a lot of times we, we hear people talking about food preferences, but we need to recognize that within the animal kingdom, not all animals reveal that. They don't really maintain preference. So this issue of preference or, or sometimes also referred to as selectivity is very frequently observed within herbivores. And we'll talk a little bit about that. We don't see it very often among carnivores. To a carnivore, an ounce of meat or protein is the same, whether it comes from a, a deer, whether it comes from a rabbit or whatever. What carnivores make their decisions on is energy investment. What's my return for the amount of energy I'm investing in capturing and handling that prey item? Because when I get it, you know, the amount or the, the quality of the meat is relatively the same. Now, that's not the case with herbivores. They display very profound uh, selection. And oftentimes it is based on the quality of the food or its nutritional value to them. Now, as managers, we have some labels and, and it sort of uh, references how we approach our thinking about food quality. In one case, we have what's referred to as the highly desired. Now, these are foods that we would say are not essential. And in many ways, I refer to them, these are the candy foods. These are the things that if you're meeting all other needs and you really want to make your habitat superior, 
These are the kind of things that you might consider adding, but they're not essential. We have the staple foods or what managers a lot of times refer to as the everyday meat and potato foods. This is what keeps your population healthy and in condition. So it needs to be ample, it needs to be diverse, and it needs to be readily available. Then we have two categories that are problematic. We have the emergency foods. Think of these as the meals ready to eat kind of situations. They're good enough to get you through a very short period of, of time. Uh, you cannot be sustained on an emergency food. We often see these uh, conditions arise this time of year. You know, when the new foods have not yet emerged, the foods remaining from the previous fall are pretty much used up and animals are, are hurting. We see them eating rhododendron or mountain laurel, for example, things that don't contain a lot of nutritious value, but it gets them through. The worst case scenario are the stuffer foods. And this is a, a horrible state to be at. Uh, I equate this to, there's no food there, you're eating the wrapper. Uh, and you definitely will not survive for long on this kind of a diet. But when you see you know, animals, for example, deer eating dry grass, that's a horrible state. That's not a normal diet for them. And they will not survive on that. And so a lot of times the management is gonna be focused, as I said, on making sure that we've provided the meat and potatoes. That's our objective. And most agencies would argue that's their mission is to assure that they are meeting that. They're not worried about the candy. They're focused on the staple. When we see populations relying on either the emergency or the stuffers, that's a management failure something is going wrong and that population is going to be in, in dire straits. <clears throat> so we see these kinds of, of reflections in how animals, particularly herbivores, uh, demonstrate their selectivity. If it's available, they're going to remove the candy first. So if you've got hostas, roses, Asiatic lilies, um, azalea bushes in your landscape, those are the candy for deer. They're gonna get nailed before anything else. And it's well known. And they will clean off every one of those things before they go back to starting to feed on the staples. Uh, so there are some hazards with this stuff, but if we know that, it also tells us, why am I planting all of that candy then? It's going to get very expensive quickly, unless you're willing to put it under very severe protection. Now, there's some other ramifications tied to food that we need to talk about. Uh, because there are the potential for creating cascade effects as a result of our management, both in terms of enhancement and in responding to conflict. So we need to be aware of what our actions might potentially lead to. And this relates to the fact that none of these species are out there in isolation on their own. They're all connected. And actions that we take on one are going to have ripple effects with others that interact with them. And it is our job as professionals to anticipate and evaluate the effects of whatever actions we're going to take in, in terms of management, how that reverberates through the ecosystem. Now, the best way to talk through this is to, to think about it in a graphical form. Uh, a lot of times we talk about food chains, uh, and here's a very simple uh, graphic of what that means. Um, 
So we have the ultimate energy that drives all food systems up here with the sun. It's necessary to grow the plants that become the production in the system. And then we have consumers of several layers here. Those that feed directly on the product, and those that feed on the consumer below them. Now, very simple, very straightforward, but also very unrealistic. This isn't how nature works. This is more reflective of what we see in nature. Now, our food chain is embedded here. You know, here's our coyote, rabbit, clover chain, but it is in the context of everything else that's going on in this particular community. And probably there's a lot more that I haven't demonstrated here. This is still kind of a, a, a just a graphical quick representation. But we need to pay attention to these connections. And something that we do within this system is going to reverberate through all of the other participants or members of this community. Now let's look at a particular case where we might have taken an action in response to a conflict. So for simplicity's sake, let's go back and look at our first food chain here. So same one, but I'm gonna change things up a little bit here. Now, instead of clover, I want you to think about replacing that clover with a field that you just had planted to oak seedlings. So this might be a reforestation, you know, you're trying to reclaim an area that maybe had been uh, cut over, uh, maybe it was fallow field and you're trying to speed things up a little bit, but you've gone out and you've planted oak seedlings throughout this area. Our offending individual, if you will, is still our cottontail rabbit. They like oak seedlings, they're going to chew on them. So we have a conflict that is, is developing here. So in terms of solution, what are some things that we can do? What might we want to think about as a possible course of action? Well, certainly one of the things, and remember I told you that we need to be thinking about non-lethal approaches first, there may be things that we can do that would reduce or eliminate access by rabbits to those seedlings. So that could be fencing, it could be some kind of barriers, uh, tree tubes, or there's a bunch of things that might come into play here. The net result is that if you've reduced access, they can't get to it, those rabbits are gonna have to go somewhere else. Another approach would be simply, let's try to reduce the rabbit population, either through trapping or shooting or some other mechanism. Again, has to be legal and appropriate, uh, but the net effect really would be the same, that you're reducing the population to a level that allows the seedlings to develop, or at least the majority of them. Now, we can't stop thinking at just that level. This is part of a system, and so we need to think about what are the reverberations here. In either case, our solution is going to lead, hopefully, to fewer rabbits. But that has implications. The predators that depend on those rabbits are going to be affected in some way. Typically, what that means, and remember I said with carnivores, their, their equation is about energy and effort. Fewer rabbits means it's going to take more energy, more time to find them, or they're going to shift off to something else that's more abundant, readily available, and require less energy to get what they need to survive. So let's put this back into the context of the larger web here. Now, we've changed it a little bit. I've got coyote rabbit to seedling over here, not clover anymore. But in our model, we've done something to affect the rabbits. And we need to be thinking then about 
all right, what's the coyote gonna do? What else in the system may be affected? And if that lines up with something else in our management plan in a negative way, then we've just made a problem bigger or worse or simply different and may have been unanticipated. So we need to be thinking about these, these repercussions all the time when we're making these decisions. Now, remember I said something about, think about alternative or supplemental foods as well. That comes into play here and has become an issue in a lot of places. What if it's something that's not in this existing web, but still is in the adjacent area and may be the most energy efficient alternative for that coyote? What if they turn to something else? Your, your, your property is right next to a sheep farm. And suddenly this year's crop of lambs just came out. They're readily available. You've created a problem for that neighbor. What about pets? We're hearing a lot about coyotes becoming habituated and moving right into the suburban areas and walking off with Fluffy and Fido. So we need to be thinking these big picture items. Okay, enough with food. I think you get the point here that there are some things we can do with food that can make conditions less favorable to those species that we prefer not to see there. Now let's talk about another one of the four horsemen, that being water. Now, similar to what we saw with food, theoretically, if you reduce the availability of water, then animals not able to fulfill their needs are gonna have to go someplace where they can get that water. The reality though, is that here in the East, we are very fortunate. We're blessed with having abundance of water. Now, we can't say that if you're, living out in the Phoenix area or someplace further west, water is a real challenge. But I would challenge you, uh, and I, I would really wanna see some, some argument here. I would challenge you if I dropped you in the woods anywhere here in the mid-Atlantic, can you go a half a mile and not run into something that would represent a water source to wildlife? Now, there may be occasional spots, but in general, that would be very difficult. We've, we're blessed with water, springs, seeps, brooks, creeks, you know, all kinds of stuff, impoundments, there's water everywhere. And realize that a lot of animals don't have to stick their face into the water to drink. They get their water in other ways. They lick it off vegetation early in the morning or after a rain. There's some that never drink at all. They get all of their water needs met by the water content in the food that they eat. And so this becomes almost moot for those species. So in terms of conflict resolution here in the East, Messing around with water generally is not going to get you any real viable relief. And so I usually don't even talk to landowners or other folks uh, about the need to manipulate this as a conflict resolution technique. The third of our four horsemen is cover or shelter. And this one, uh, combined with food, is probably the one of these things that we really focus on. Uh, for one thing, um, it, there's a lot of latitude, a lot of opportunity with what we can do. And it's a lot easier to manipulate habitat and cover than it is a lot of these other factors. And so this is the one where we spend a lot of our time and efforts in trying to purposefully manipulate the habitat in a way to make them unattractive or unavailable to those animals that we do not want or would choose to not see 
uh, in our properties. So how do we do that? Well, first and foremost, we have to recognize how animals use habitat from a cover perspective. Okay, this is not a static kind of, of use. It's very dynamic and it changes with season and it changes with the age and the sex of the animal. And we have to recognize it in those terms. Now, again, we don't have time to go in great depth to this stuff, but here are just some examples of different types of cover that from an enhancement standpoint, we would want to make sure have been addressed. You know, are all of these particular needs being met? Now, if they are, we want to re-examine them and look at them from the perspective of the offending animal. Is there something that I'm providing that with a little bit of manipulation, I can make unattractive or remove from a viable standpoint to a, a, a not so good situation. That's our challenge when we're talking about cover manipulation. What are the things that we can effectively manipulate that makes these animals want to go elsewhere? Now, this is a tough one because this is also where compromise is gonna come into play. Uh, a lot of these same aspects are critically important to those species that we do want. And in places where they overlap with the needs of the offending species, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, you may be able to reduce things, but the trade-off is going to be you may have fewer of the ones that you want as well. So it's a tricky one. Now, although we didn't spend any time really talking about it, I wanna to return to the concept of edge because this comes up all the time in discussions with landowners. And I think we've been kind of guilty in pounding on this one for so long uh, as kind of a necessity. It's the essential to do in habitat enhancement. And the, the intent here is that the more well-developed the edges that you create, are, the better the habitat will be. More diversity, more individuals, more different individuals there. Uh, all of that is true, but there are some consequences. There are some species that do not benefit from the creation of edge. They're very susceptible to fragmentation, and you literally will drive populations down in the efforts of creating more edge. Uh, we often refer to them as interior species. But a well-developed edge, while, may, while it's good for maybe some of the species that we really have interest in, there are going to be trade-offs here. The reason it is so good for a lot of the, the species that we often are trying to enhance is that a well-developed edge is also very good at keeping predators at bay. Uh, a good edge should provide excellent hiding cover and increases the survival of those species that are living in a well-developed habitat as an edge. But from the conflict standpoint, what if those species are the offending ones? A good edge is going to enhance their survival as well. And so we need to be thinking about this in terms of those parcels that we're creating. Are we creating the opportunity for that offensive one to hide, uh, to perhaps spend a lot of time in protective cover to do the nasty things that it's doing? That's one of the outcomes that potentially may arise here. A lot of times that's why you see farmers despite our recommendations to maintain field edges and enhance them where, where they can, they refuse to, because that's where the groundhogs are going to be. That's where the things that potentially feed on their crop are gonna be. And so that's why they've adopted these vertical abrupt edges 
uh, and choose not to have this kind of habitat. Now, from a homeowner's perspective, a lot of times they don't look at their property from the perspective of habitat and particularly edges. And the ones that are really well-developed, highly landscaped, uh, really the goal in a lot of these cases is for sort of maximum aesthetic effect. Look at all the edges that exist in this particular situation here. And I would also ask you to focus on where do you see that well-developed edge? It's right up against the house. That's not where we want to be concentrating animals or having them feel comfortable in spending time there. Uh, if you've had problems with rodents, that's partially well, perhaps why that has happened. You've given them opportunity to feel comfortable, safe, and spend time looking around the foundation trying to find a way to get in. Now, this may be a little bit extreme for some people, but you don't see a lot of edge here. It still is aesthetic, looks pretty good maybe a little bit stark, but certainly there's not a lot of what I would label as protective cover. And you don't see real dense growth right up against the house. There aren't very many animals that are going to find this inviting. Uh, they're not going to be willing to spend time there out in the open. So we can use understanding of edge and cover to our advantage in these cases. Keep the cover to the periphery, away from the home or away from the garden. You can still have wildlife, but you're controlling where it will be. Okay, the last of the four horsemen is space. This is a tough one. And it's one that's very difficult to manipulate because what we're talking about is you know, the full amount of area that an animal needs to survive. Uh, a lot of times we talk about it as what's their territory, what's their home range. It's not exactly accurate, but for, you know, just, you know, generic understanding, it gives you the, the concept, so to speak. Now, a lot of times animals have large space needs and they cross multiple property ownerships. And we can't do a dang thing about something on somebody else's property. Okay, that's not in our purview. How we do manipulate space though, is through some other strategies, exclusion, fencing, and perhaps the use of repellents are all different methods that we have available to alter the space use of animals. And we can really target this approach or set of approaches to those offending species. Now, just a cautionary note, um, I note in a lot of stuff that gets to landowners, there's been a growing uh, set of recommendations, if you will, to consider uh, fencing, and particularly the, the black or the dark green plastic mesh fences, <clears throat> we've got some serious problems arising as a result of that. Not that they don't work, but for them to be really effective, wildlife need to see those. And with those dark colors and placed right on or right next to the vegetation for which they're being used to protect, they don't see it until they get into it. And so entanglement has become a very serious issue for wildlife. And we need to think hard about this before we start making recommendations about um, the use of fencing. I'm a very strong proponent of fencing, and there's a lot of designs that I recommend and I use frequently, but there's a right way and a wrong way to install these things. And so we don't want to be seeing animals in these situations, 
um, there's a higher mortality rate than I think most people envision with fences. So just a cautionary note here. Now, something that is also related to space is how animals do distribute themselves on the landscape. There's a wide misperception out there among landowners that animals are just randomly distributed, or in some cases, another greater misperception is that they're evenly spaced out. That's anything but the truth. What we actually see on the ground is what we refer to as a clumped, a clustered, or a patchy distribution. And it's a direct reflection of the underlying habitat. The better the quality of the habitat, the more resource that's going to be provided, the more attraction it will have. And it'll have more ability to support more individuals. And so we see this clustering on the landscape of animals um, using those resources where they're available. Now that is mediated though within certain species, those that exhibit territoriality, they're gonna keep others at bay. And so even though the resource theoretically could support greater diversity or higher numbers, it ain't ever gonna happen because of that social dynamic that is imposed. <clears throat> uh, and that's pretty severe. Um, they will keep numbers down as part of their hierarchy. <clears throat> the other thing that we need landowners to understand is that animals don't recognize our artificial boundaries, whether they're political or property. Animals are going to go where they want to go. The other concept is they're not your wildlife. They're everybody's wildlife. And I spent a lot of time working with hunt clubs and, and some pretty large landowner holdings, and they're investing small fortunes in habitat improvement and enhancements. And they get really upset when that big buck, that big 12 pointer walks across the property line and their neighbor shoots it. When they invested all the time and in, in effort in feeding it and making it fat and growing it. And they get really upset. That was my buck. Sorry, it don't work that way. The other thing is that despite your best efforts, your success or failure oftentimes is going to be determined by what's going on around you. Now, that can be a good thing or a bad thing in some ways that from an enhancement standpoint, there are going to be certain trade-offs and repercussions. But from the conflict side, you may be doing everything right. You know, you shouldn't be having a problem. But because of something that your neighbor is doing, you know, think of the individual who is putting out bag after bag of cracked corn, uh, throwing dog kibbles all over the backyard or whatever. That supplemental food is going to draw in uh, unrealistically or unnatural density of animals that have to go someplace. And they're going to be waiting on the periphery for that next deluge of food to come. And in the meantime, they're congregating on your property. Even though you've done nothing, your responsibility is overlooked here. You're at the whim of what's going on around you. And that happens a lot more than I think people realize. And oftentimes there's very little that you can do about it. And you get into some very serious neighborhood squabbles. Now, before we start looking at some examples here, I want to bring up just one more area of, of concern, sort of the theoretics of the underlie habitat and enhancement activities. And that is this realm of population dynamics. Now, I'm not going to get into this in great detail, but I want to just call attention to some things that as managers, as resource um, people working with landowners, we need to have them understand, or perhaps, you know, even ourselves need to refresh ourselves and understand more so. 
And again, it relates to that larger web of life out there. But we do want to pay attention to certain reproductive parameters and what the potential for population expansion might be. Things that we want to consider about the individual animals with which we are working. You know, what is their survival? What's their longevity? What are their mortality factors? All of these things are going to be part of the formula that we develop and incorporate into our plan uh, for working with wildlife on a property. Now, let me give you an example of why this is important. One of the more serious offending species that we have are voles. Here's the reproductive data on voles and why they are so bad. These things have five to seven litters a year and each litter is composed of eight to 12 pups. Individuals mature in the year in which they are born and they begin to breed in the year in which they are born. Start doing the math here. Think about the reproductive explosion that is possible when we have uh, an outbreak with voles on our properties. The savior here is that it's rare that a vole lives more than two years. Otherwise, we would probably be up to our eyeballs in voles. But that's why it's important to know what we're working with when we're talking about dealing with a conflict species. It has relevance and important relevance. Okay, a lot of theory here, a lot of background. Um, let me just sort of wrap some things up here. There is a place for us to consider all of those principles and sort of theoretical aspects to habitat management from both the enhancement and from the resolution perspective. We can use them in either case. It allows us also to anticipate, if we've done our homework correctly, where to expect problems to arise elsewhere within the system and what to anticipate in terms of reactions to whatever management actions we may have taken. The other thing, which we didn't spend much time on, but when we do management, it's not a once and done deal ever. Uh, we're talking about repeated maintenance of activities. Whatever you do from a management perspective has a life expectancy on it. Animals are gonna adapt. Conditions are going to change. Natural succession does not stop. And so we have to be ready for that. We have to anticipate those changes and take that into account as we're developing plans for either enhancing conditions and promoting species or responding to conflicts and modifying conditions. Those modifications are not going to stay in place. And so it's gonna require periodic maintenance and adjustment. Okay, so there's the theory, if you will. What I wanna do at this point is actually get in and look at some case studies of problematic conflicts. And again, we could spend all night and all week for that matter, looking at particular cases. So I'm gonna, run through a couple of examples here of the kinds of things that are hot button issues, uh, things that we know people are dealing with. Now, it's not going to be comprehensive because we don't have time to do that, but I, it will highlight some of the applications that I've been talking about. So I want to look at, as case studies, what's going on with bears, uh, wildlife in general in our home landscapes, you know, again, for small property, bird feeding stations are hot. Uh, right now, we are spending close to, I think the last figure I saw was $3 billion a year 
in expenditures associated with birds, bird feeding, and bird observation. It is a huge industry. Some issues with supplemental feeding, uh, and then a few tips about some forest enhancement activities that will go counter to what's in your handbook. Okay, so let's start with bears. Uh, here's a nice little individual. Now, at least here in Virginia, it used to be pretty rare in many parts of the state to even see a bear. Now, as our populations have grown uh, today, there really is no place in Virginia where you would never expect to see a bear. Now, numbers aren't going to be really plentiful in some areas, but you know, theoretically or realistically, you could run into a bear just about anywhere in Virginia. Now, the unfortunate thing is where we're running into them and where our interactions occur is not necessarily good. And having bears in close proximity to people or to our properties is not a good thing. So why is this occurring? What's going on that is causing bears to look to humans as resource and feeling comfortable coming near us? Well, there's some things we can point to. And a lot of times it is due to our own behavior <clears throat> or the implications of changing our behavior you know, what the ramifications of that would be. We have real ample evidence that a lot of our bear problems are due to human activities. It's pretty routine today. You know, your garbage pickup comes tomorrow. I will guarantee the majority of people on that garbage pickup route already have their garbage cans out to the curbside right now. And what we've done throughout all of our communities is we have amply stocked the pantry for a whole host of wildlife, but bears in particular. They have recognized these little containers as food receptacles. And so we shouldn't have anticipated that that would not create a problem. Now, if it isn't a bear, it's going to be something else. Why are we putting those containers out and allowing free access all night long? Well, it's convenience. We didn't want to have to get up early to do it first thing in the morning. But is it a convenience when you have to go out and pick up everything that got strewn across the front yard because of that? We're also changing bear behavior. These bears are very quickly becoming habituated. They are showing less and less fear of humans. They're out in the middle of the day and they have found these containers and the big dumpsters as well, commercial ones, as viable food resource. It's a heck of a lot easier. It's more energy efficient to go to these things than it is to stay in the woods and work your butt off trying to find food. It is making bears very comfortable being in close proximity to humans. And that should scare people because that kind of interaction isn't gonna lead to something good. And these kinds of incidents, these close encounters are becoming much more common. And it really is largely due to our own activities. We've encouraged them to come. They've made an association between us and our activities and that food resource. And in many ways, they're expecting it. So when we work with landowners, this is a real educational moment, but it will be a terribly difficult one. People do not want to be inconvenienced, and it's going to be a hard sell to convince them not to put that stuff out there at night. But that's what we need to do. 
Now, there are other problems with bears. Again, we don't have a lot of time left to get into a lot of these things. But bears and bird feeders, uh, there's a lot of activity and interest expressed now among landowners with regard to pollinators and beekeeping. Unfortunately, we've got a lot of folks who are very ill-prepared and ill for inappropriately informed about how to care for that. I mean, this is a perfect example. You can see in the background, they've got an electric fence. Unfortunately, they did not maintain it, did not check voltage. All it takes is one opportunity. The bear will keep testing that system. And if they encounter it when it's down or weak, they're in. And this represented a pretty serious economic hit to this individual. Farmers are having a lot of problems with bear and corn lately. The telltale sign of that is bears will go into the middle of the field, they'll sit down on their backside and literally create a crop circle where they reach out, grab a stock, pull it in, pull the ear off of it, eat that ear, reach for the next stock and repeat that until everything within easy reach has already been consumed. They have to get up and move and they'll go a short distance plunk down and start over again. And so you get these in the middle of the field, these crop circles. Now from the ground, you can't see them. And a lot of times you may be able to see that right here, there is the combine harvester. He's chopping corn and they don't know this is going on until they cut through and get into that section and find the devastation. Uh, real serious economic impact here. <clears throat> uh, and so it's a, it's a bad one for, for farmers. They're dealing with it pretty much all the time down our way. <clears throat> uh, but particularly so in those years of drought or when there's an acorn crop failure. Um, not a whole lot that we really can do about it. Uh, one of the most effective strategies that I, we've been experimenting with here, if you've got a hunt club that needs to exercise their bear dogs, uh, make a deal with them. They would love to be able to do a chase to run their dogs and, and get some experience and they'll run the dogs through the field. And that bear ain't gonna hang around. A Couple of times of doing that, and we've had farmers that haven't had a problem with bears for quite a while. Uh, inexpensive, basically it's a trade-off. Uh, so there are ways to handle these things uh, kind of innovatively. Okay, let's look at a very different kind of a situation, uh, sort of what I would call the general home landscape that could be either for aesthetic purposes, it could be a vegetable garden, whatever. Obviously, somebody has put in a lot of time and investment in this particular example. But as I look at it, and as I knew the individual involved in this particular case, they never thought about the need for or ways in which to protect that investment. And they created a very rich habitat here, one that was highly attractive. Uh, they literally set the table, but yet they didn't anticipate those effects. Should they have? Certainly. And that's part of our educational challenge with landowners, that anticipation. Because there's going to be a lot of interest from a lot of different species. Uh, this is just a small subset, but none of these would be unexpected. And every one of them is gonna have their own sort of unique challenges um, on how to keep them out, what they'd be interested in. But in all cases, they're herbivores, they're gonna demonstrate their preferences. Uh, and we need to take advantage of what we know about that kind of information to devise the deterrence that we would be using. Simplest strategy is use some fencing here. Um, maybe, some repellents, but 
they don't have a very good track record, uh, and particularly with deer. When the deer density gets above a certain threshold, there isn't a repellent that will ever work. Now here in Virginia, and I can't say for sure in other areas, but I would guess it's fairly similar. If you're in an area where deer density is in the 35 to 40 deer per square mile range, you'd better not be counting on much success from repellents. You're at a level where the number of mouths in the environment is to a certain level or sufficient that there's competition for resource. And so it doesn't matter how bad it tastes or smells. If you've got to eat, you're going to eat whatever you can. And so that competition only gets worse as deer numbers go up. And so I tell people that if you're in a moderate to high density deer environment, don't waste your money on it repellents because you will go through that stuff like liquid. Uh, and it gets very expensive and you're not gonna be happy with the results. Uh, now there are some differences among repellents and if you can find several that at least offer some temporary relief. You can cycle those, use them in a rotation, but even then the animals will begin to acclimate to them. Now, the other point I wanna make with this particular one is that this owner did everything according to what we would have labeled as good horticultural practice. When they made the beds, they were using a drip irrigation system. Uh, they put down this uh, synthetic weed material to keep weeds at bay, but therein lies the problem. It wasn't too far after installation that this kind of evidence began to appear in the vicinity of the gardens, and particularly right along the edges of where that weed barrier had been put in place. Literally, what you have created is a vole hotel. Predators can't get through those weed barriers. They can't even detect whether there are voles present or not. And what these animals do is they burrow in from the edge of the garden and all you see is this one inch hole, one inch diameter hole, no excavation. The, the hole just sort of opens up and goes underground. And they tunnel all through that bed, eating off all the roots underneath the weed barrier. Now it's demonstrated in some other ways too. If this is a woody plant landscape, you're going to start to see uh, stunting of growth. You're going to see a discoloration, this sort of chlorotic yellowing of the leaves. That's because it's losing its root system. The voles have completely chewed away the fine root network of those plants. And you don't even know it's going on because it's underneath that barrier or underneath your mulch. And it's all because of this little guy. Now there's another thing going on, and again, this relates to your unexpected, your uninvited. Well, this guy wasn't planned for, but for some people, it gets even worse. This is probably our number one prey species among the mammal world. Uh, there are more species that rely on voles as prey than any other species. What else shows up is this guy very effective mouse. And people get upset when they see this. Oh, I don't want a snake in my garden. Well, it's doing you a service. Uh, it's eating this guy. And so there's, again, one of these trade-offs. If you don't like the voles, what are you going to do about it? You can rely to a certain degree on natural predation, but they've got to be able to see the predator prey, and they got to be able to access it. They can't get to it underneath those barriers. Typically what it's gonna to take to deal with a vole problem of the size and scope that we typically see, it's gonna be a very regimented toxicant program. There's nothing else that I can recommend that I know will work. So this is one of those few exceptions that I referred to earlier when I talked about lethal methods 
I don't even begin to talk about non-lethal strategies if we can identify and are confident it's a vol problem. You got to get the toxicants out right away or it'll be too late. Remember the reproductive potential? You got to hit it hard and fast. Okay, we got a few more minutes here and a few more topics, so I want to go quickly here. Um, bird feeding is a big issue, but it comes with a responsibility and a clear understanding of what it is you're actually trying to attract versus what's actually going to show up. Most people, they have a pretty set list of the kind of things that they want to see, and they're pretty effective at getting them to come. If you got the right seed selection, you will draw them. But you're going to attract a bunch of other things too. And very often, it's a, a result of mismanagement of the bird feeding station. If you let seed build up underneath the feeders, you got accumulation of spent seeds and shells. That is habitat. It's going to attract insects. It's going to attract uh, worms, night crawlers, grubs, things that feed on that detritus, if you will. That in turn is going to attract other animals. Think the food web here. One of the first visitors that shows up very often under a bird feeder is going to be a skunk. And I think most of us know the repercussions that come from that. <clears throat> and then people start complaining, golly, geez, you know, Fido got sprayed again. Gosh, I hate those skunks. Well, you did it. You invited them. And it was from the mismanagement. Some other things that are going to show up. Again, a lot of rodents, small mammals will utilize that stuff that's on the ground or sometimes actually up in the feeders. That's going to draw the predators that feed on them. And so here's another case where I get a lot of complaints from landowners about snakes. Well, if you don't have abundant food for them where you don't want them, they're not going to be there. So solve the rodent problem, you often will solve the snake problem. Another one that I always get calls for this time of year, people who have these really large, very active feeding stations forgot about the predator-prey dynamic. If you've got an artificially high density of prey species using your facility, it's going to attract predators. The big one is either a sharp shin, as I've got here, or a cooper's hawk. These are hawks that feed on other birds, and people get really emotional and upset when they see one of these guys come in and pick off their morning does. <clears throat> it's nature in action. If you don't like this, reduce the number of feeders, spread them out, anything you can do to make those other users, the prey, less dense or more widely disturbed, distributed. That often will make the hawks less effective. Some other things that will be attracted and will have repercussions. You will be attracting certain animals depending on what you feed. If you've got suet feeders, you're gonna see woodpeckers. Woodpeckers tend to hang around in an environment, and if you remove the feeders, that doesn't mean they're going to leave. And I've had a number of cases of woodpeckers banging on the side of the house, uh, looking for other alternative foods, uh, which was demonstrated in this particular case. And you can see the evidence of it up here. Uh, the siding in this case was infested with wood boring insects. So you took down all of your feeders at the end of the feeding season, where do the woodpeckers go? The next other reliable, close at hand food source. They're going to get these grubs that are in your site. So you need to be thinking about these things again and that larger web. Hi, Jim. This is so great to hear and see all these examples. I have this exact picture that 
that you just showed with all the holes in the tree trunks uh, in my backyard. I'm just taking note of the time. It's 8.29. We got just a couple of seconds to finish here. I'm going to go very quickly here. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim, because we do have some questions. So I appreciate that. I'm sorry to interrupt you guys. I know he's giving us some good information. Thanks, Jim. Okay, one more. After this, we just got one more unit quickly. Okay, anybody recognize this? Um, this is sap sucker damage. Um, probably the typical form. Here's a pretty extensive form. But it's all due to this little organism. Um, it can do some pretty serious damage and very often it will be attracted to feeding stations and then it stays in the area and, and finds other ways um, to be active. So that's a pretty serious situation when it gets to this extent. So again, think about bird feeders. Okay, the supplemental feeding issue is, is one that I really don't understand why people feel a need to do it, but they do it all the time. Uh, and particularly with deer, how many do you really need? There is no reason why if your habitat management is effective, there should be no reason for supplemental feeding at all. Where we see it happen most often is what we do with our pets and with the food resources that are left outdoors. This you never wanna see because it's gonna lead to these kinds of conflicts. And in this particular case, this is our number one rabies vector species here in the east. Very defensive, very territorial. It's gonna interact with your pet. The pet comes in at night, crawls around on your lap, digs its claws in, and you have just become infected. Serious problems with food. We should not be doing this. Okay, the last one, and this is a kind of an important one for me because it goes counter to what so many people are being recommended. That in reforestation and certain habitat improvements, we do planting. And the recommended approach to protecting that resource is as demonstrated here. Um, this has become kind of a staple uh, with certain cost share programs, but this is sort of the essential required elements, the tree tube, a support, and a weed berry. We have just set the table for disaster. And it's unfortunate that this is being recommended in the ways that it is. As I mentioned, cost share, this is a very typical in programs. We see this all over the place in terms of riparian establishment, and I see that's your topic next week. Uh, so maybe this will resonate, <clears throat> but we do some things wrong. Remember our problem with the voles in the home landscape? It is no different here. We are required under CREP standards to use that weed barrier, but what we're creating, if you were to lift up that barrier after a year, this is what you very often will see. When it comes time to remove the tree tube, this is the kind of evidence that you're very likely to see. Uh, you can actually see kind of the remaining outline here of where that weed barrier was, and you can see the vole holes. It's it's a recipe for a failure that we know is going to occur. And instead, I've been successful in arguing with some of the, the uh, NRCS standards folks to abandon those weed barriers and to go to herbicide strips so that you're not providing additional cover that is gonna promote the activity of those voles. Now, it also means that you've got to have some kind of other vegetation management going on uh, in the vicinity because the voles still, if you're not really effective with your herbicide treatments, they will come. So that's problem number one. I hate those stupid weed barriers, and I would encourage others, do not use them. The bigger one, though, is the false claims that are being made about these things being effective for deer protection. 
The standard tube that is being used is generally in the four foot range, sometimes five feet. But the bigger you go, the more expensive it gets. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these things. They're basically mini greenhouses. You get very rapid growth of the seedling within the tube. It pops out the top and then basically stops its upward growth and puts strength back into the main stem. In the meantime, though, this part that pops out gets a little bit bigger, more robust. Unfortunately, it's right at mouth level. And we literally are training deer to look for these tubes and to use them as feeding on those candy specimens. A lot of times we're planting species that would be very highly attractive. If you're gonna use these things, it gets expensive, but you shouldn't be using anything in a high deer region that's less than six feet. That will make it a little bit more of a challenge thing. It doesn't mean that it'll eliminate it, but it makes it that much more difficult. Now, there are some ramifications to that. The longer the tube, the longer the bowl of the stem is, the more weak it tends to be. It also requires a very substantial stake to hold this thing up. Uh, so cost becomes a factor but I've had so many places where they've gone to the cost and the effort of putting these things in place and they still get clicked off. So I want folks to think about that. Okay, wrapping it up here. If nothing else, I hope I've been able to get you to think holistically about all of these principles, what it is that we're doing and how we might be able to use these principles in reverse and to also make sure that we're abiding by legal methodologies here. It gets complicated and it gets tough out there. So with that, I will stop here. Um, sorry for going over just a little bit, uh, but I certainly would welcome, and if you're able to stay on, um, I'll stay here as long as we've got questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. Great. Thank you. I was just thinking, but how much I have in common with those deer, I happen to have my own candy reserve here, my own Dove chocolates, <laughs> so I can relate. <laughs> I really appreciate this discussion from going from inventory to seeing the bigger picture. You've given us a lot to think about, so I really appreciate appreciate it. And we do have some questions in the Q&A and um, I can't seem to forward my slides, but your contact information is there. That's what's most important. So some of the questions we had are, uh, sorry, now I'm out of control here with my, can't seem to advance my slides to where I want them to be. Here we go. Um, I am noticing the time, so I did want to let everybody know, uh, but we are going to go forward with some more questions, but uh, just wanted to let everybody know that next Tuesday we'll be talking about that riparian buffers and maybe we can incorporate some of Jim's thinking uh, when we're hearing our discussion next week. So we appreciate you guys joining us next week, but I'll put Jim's contact back here as we go through some of these questions, Jim. So um, what do you do if you find an injured animal? Okay, that's gonna depend on what's allowable in your state. Um, here in Virginia, we have a network of wildlife rehabilitation facilities. Um, there actually is a, a page on our um, wildlife resource department website that allows people to find out who are the certified and licensed rehabbers. I don't know whether that exists in all states or not. Um, <clears throat> but I guess one of the things I would caution here is um, there is a need to do a little bit of a triage here. What we, what, at least for our folks, they will not accept an animal that is not injured or not in need of treatment. 
uh, they actually can lose their license to operate by doing that. Um, so you need to make a determination. Is this simply an orphaned animal that fell out of a nest? If so, leave it alone. Um, monitor it. But if there is true evidence of, of trauma or something, um, find out who in your state uh, has listings of rehab facilities and take it there. Do and not try to do this on your own. Definitely the Maryland Department of um, Natural Resources has that. And if I had the ability to find that link for you right now, I'd put it all in the chat. But there is, Jim, just like you had said, Maryland also has that list of licensed um, rehabilitators, whether they're federally licensed and state licensed. You know, I, there's some intricacies with that. So thank you for that. So, um, Somebody was talking about uh, migratory Canadian geese are a significant issue in terms of damage to winter cover, field crops, and impact on livestock. Any ideas on how to keep them from settling in for the winter? A lot of that is going to depend on what the past history in that immediate area has been. <clears throat> a lot of these geese today are not migratory. They're what we call resident geese, and they're well acclimated. They've learned where a lot of these resources are, and so they are terribly difficult to deal with. Um, I would suggest one of the best things you can do is get to know your representative for the USDA Wildlife Services office in your state. They have people who are trained, they have the resources available to deal with these things. And for most landowners, that's the best route to go. Now, in some states, they do not provide on-site technical assistance with an individual. Okay. Um, they are not allowed to because of competition with the private sector. <clears throat> but for large owners, for businesses, for farm operations, they do work with them and can set up specific tailored management programs with those folks uh, to try to deal with these things. Mm -hmm. Typically, they're going to try harassment techniques first. Um, secondly, so they're going to call Agnes. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're going to set up different devices, maybe pyrotechnics, their uh, propane cannons. There's a whole bunch of tools they have in their toolbox to try to drive them away. Um, the other thing which they do become involved with, although this is one of the better kept secrets from the general public, uh, they do conduct goose roundups. Uh, during the flightless season, which is late June into July, geese cannot fly long distance. And they're very easily rounded up. <clears throat> and in some areas, um, they have working relationships with either wildlife rehabilitation facilities, dog pounds, uh, animal uh, care facilities, and any of the product that they have um, captured is euthanized and made available as food in those areas. Sounds yummy, sounds yummy. Now they used to do it with food banks, um, but FDA got involved and we don't know what these geese have consumed and so they're no longer able to use these things in human food banks. <clears throat> uh, we have a question here about recommendations for discouraging rats. My recommendation is don't put out the cheese. <laughs> what does the expert have to say? <laughs> well, I wish it were that easy. <clears throat> um, usually there is going to be some underlying reason for why they've shown up. And in many cases, it's because a reliable food source or water source has become available. Um, <clears throat> I've seen this happen a lot of times around horse facilities uh, where bunks of grain are stocked heavily and, and stay available 24-7. Uh, some cattle operations similarly. 
Uh, I've seen it in residential areas where people have improperly managed composting facilities. Mm. Um, any place where people are raising other domestic animals. Chickens are becoming a major issue in suburban areas. Again, partially because of the food that's available. Um, but that's what's attracting the rats. And once they get there, it's not unusual to see very extensive warrens develop. Uh, these are intricate tunnel systems. And when you walk on it, it's like walking on a sponge of, of Swiss cheese. Um, it is terribly difficult to get rid of them because unless you eliminate all of the food resource, it's almost impossible. Okay. So similar to what I was describing with voles, very often this is going to involve a very well-designed and implemented toxicant program. Okay, great. Uh, that was a good segue too because somebody was commenting and I think you answered it in your presentation about um, putting the plastic around the base of the tree seed the the buffer trees that are being planted so he that that person was asking questions about the tunneling and eating the tree roots so I'm glad you addressed that thank you somebody else had a tree question here what is the best way to protect evergreen saplings um Generally, we try not to put evergreens in tree tubes. It has some really strong impacts on deforming what that future tree is going to look like. Um, you can do some serious damage to an evergreen in a tree tube. So I, I wouldn't go that route. <clears throat> Typically, what I would take is probably developing the next best thing or similar approach and installing some kind of a... a either individual or depending on how close together these things may be planted, a sort of a community enclosure. Um, here's where a tactical approach of using that plastic fencing or some other type of meshed material will provide effects of keeping most herbivores at bay. Um, it isn't gonna do a dang thing for voles um, so in that case, any of the strategies that we had talked about before are probably going to come into play. Um, the biggest thing I've seen with voles and conifers is the low hanging branches and the failure to maintain weed control around the seedling. Uh, you need to keep bare ground or very low growth vegetation on a pretty good perimeter around these these seedlings until they get bigger. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, so this next question, uh, we're considering raising Krugers to replace the Keystone animal in Chester, in Chester County. I see he was just joking, but he had a serious question or she, Christopher had a serious question. Has anyone in Pennsylvania or Virginia introduced cougars to help the deer get back in check? Or 50 to 75% hunts instead of 30% reduction? Any, any thoughts on this? Yeah. yeah, this comes up all the time. Okay. Uh, I will say there are people who are looking at this. <clears throat> um, some of you from a little further north probably are aware that there's a sort of a move afoot to bring wolves back to the northern tier. Mm -hmm. uh, northern New York, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine are seriously looking at that. Uh, but there's been occasional discussion of, you know, why don't we bring cougars back? Well, from a social perspective, it's not acceptable to the general public. And there isn't an agency in the world that's going to consider that at this time, mm -hmm. given the size of that predator and all that we know about it. Secondly, um, it's an animal that has a tremendously large home range. Mm -hmm. And in terms of its effectiveness as a predator, you're never going to be able to establish enough cougars to have an impact population-wide on deer. So it's kind of fruitless going in that direction. Now, it's not to say, and I, again, I'll get disagreement, um, <clears throat> but it's not to say that we don't have some animals out there. Um, 
most managers, most biologists with the state agencies will say they don't exist here in the East. Um, I have personal experience to say that's not quite true. Mm. All the ones that I've had interaction with have been somebody's pet mm. or a captive individual that has escaped. And for whatever reason, the uh, sort of the, the drug lords somehow find these things to be items of, of uh, intrigue. Having them as pets is great until they can't control them and then they turn them out. The cougars, okay. Um, so yeah. we've had animals running around, but they rarely survive. They get hit by cars. Um, they, they're not used to living in the environment. The exception to that, though, was, and maybe some of you remember this, uh, it was probably 10 years ago now, a cougar showed up in Connecticut and was hit by a car and died there. But when they did the genetics on it, it came from South Dakota. Oh, wow. And it gives you an indication that these animals are capable and some are moving long distances. Um, we know we've got them in our neighbor state now on the western edge of Tennessee. So it's maybe just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it may happen. Hey, who knows? Okay, so let's get back onto that bull train. What were we calling it? Hot pockets, these bulls, I guess. Some people call them the hot pockets. So Jim, what do you recommend? What type of toxicants do you recommend for bull infestation? Can you give us some advice on that? Yeah, there is a, a kind of a strategy here. Now, again, it's going to depend on what it comes back to my point early. It depends on what's legal and allowable in your state. The strategy that I've been using here in Virginia, and, and I know some other places it is used, it's a two-stage approach. Um, and it does take some monitoring uh, and some evaluation throughout the process. But basically, you've got to find exactly where the active zones are. Right. There's no point in putting out product where you don't have voles. It gets very expensive and the, the likelihood of non-target loss goes up. So once you know where you've got activity, uh, first thing I usually would recommend is applications of zinc phosphide. Now that's a restricted use material. You've got to have the advanced certification to acquire and apply that material. But that's your first hit approach. Um, and again, there's, there's recommendations that are available for how much to put out and, and where to place it and that kind of stuff. But we usually hit them hard with zinc phosphide right from the get-go. And that will knock a population way down, huh. but it will not eliminate it. Voles will wise up to and begin to show bait shyness or bait resistance. And that's where your monitoring needs to be very effective to determine when that happens. And then you need to do what I call a mop-up operation. And we have two other products that usually are pretty effective at that. Um, and there's, there's arguments about which one to use in which situation. I think either one would work, but uh, we have a couple of products, again, both of which are restricted use materials, but either a diphasinone or a chlorphasinone. Um, that's usually what I would use as a mop-up. Uh, and again, you treat only those areas where you see the residual left over from your zinc phosphide approach. Uh, and that usually will give you almost 100% um, coverage. Well, what a great strategy for um, the, land, the, the green industry professional to hear that too, right? So now they can talk to the landowner that they have these tools, they have the license to be able to implement these strategies against the voles so that they can meet their landowner objectives if they're planting trees or whatever they're doing so that was great um so uh i'm going to go to this vole question and then i'm going to end off with it because somebody popped popped in with a vole question if rodicides are used to control voles how do you prevent a cascade effect through the food chain 
Excellent question. Uh, and I didn't have the time to go over that, but there are some real measures that we use. <clears throat> uh, an effective treatment, like I had just explained, the, the zinc phosphide and the, the phasinone approach, needs to be done in, in one of several ways. Burrow treatment only. In other words, you're putting your product into defined burrows that you have located. There is no application of these materials broadcast. Okay, okay? That's, that's a no-no. You never do that. Another way to do it is that you can actually install um, PVC feeding stations underground. Huh. Uh, basically, you get one inch diameter PVC pipe and a, a couple of lengths and a T. And you're basically creating an upside down T, uh -huh. which you would then bury underground uh, to the level of where most of the tunneling activity that you've observed exists. The riser piece needs to be above ground because that's your access. But you can put a, another piece PVC cover on it, but you fill that tea with your product uh, in insufficient quantity, but it's all going to be underground. And you can periodically check and monitor by looking down the tube as to whether it's being taken or not. I think the more common route, though, most landowners or commercial operators that I've worked with um, end up using bait boxes, mm -hmm. uh, which they then place underneath uh, some other object that would restrict access to any other organism. Uh, a favorite one we use in nurseries, in apple orchards, is to um, get a big old truck tire, cut it in half around the round, so you have two semicircle loops, if you will, and you can set those so that the concavity is up and you can put a bait box underneath that and pin it down or weight it down. Some folks will just use a five gallon pail that's inverted, put a bait box underneath it, put a brick on top of it uh, and put those through a, a landscape garden bed or something. Uh, if the bait is abundant and available, the voles will tunnel to find it. <clears throat> The field of dreams there. You build it and they will come. That would that was that's what we learned at the beginning. Yep. Now in some reforestation ones, there's actually um, what's called a tunnel builder. Uh, it's a mechanical device that follows behind a tractor. And literally what it's doing is creating a trench. Huh. Um, but it 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 opens a trench much like a planter does, mm -hmm. um, and it allows you to drop um product in that trench and then it folds back over itself as it progresses and so a lot of times people who are putting out a lot of seedlings uh, will use a, a tunnel builder um, as a means of distributing material safely wow you gave us a lot of strategies there jim thanks <clears throat> so i think this is our last question because it looks like we have already 17 answered questions so that, that that's been great we've had a lot of activity um, and if you haven't answered, got, gotten your answer, your question answered, please, Jim, his email is right there. Contact your local extension agent uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, here in Maryland, you can contact me or Jonathan Kays. Julianne is in Pennsylvania there. She's on the line here too. So um, let's wrap up with this last question, eh, Jim? So this is an interesting one. We talked a little bit about the beaver on Tuesday. So this one, understanding the importance of beavers, establishing new habitats, but afraid they are potentially being pushed into watersheds areas due to their habitat loss from human population. There is a major conflict trying to maintain sufficient growing, there is a major conflict trying to maintain sufficient growing water demands for human population growth. What's, what's next for encouraging what's next for encouraging beaver growth? So I'm wondering if they're talking about discouraging beaver growth. 
I guess we can interpret that however you feel you want to answer that, Jim. Well, I, 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 can, I hear several messages in that one. <clears throat> um, I guess first and foremost, we know beavers are valuable. Um, they are terribly effective at creating um, wonderful habitat for other wildlife, um, particularly those you know, that are wetland species. Uh, so it's something that we want to have around, um, but they, it comes with some baggage um, because of their skills in manipulating water. Uh, when they do that in places that are inappropriate, that's where we have our conflict. Um, so they can flood out roads, they can block culverts, they back up water into people's septic systems or flood basements. So there are issues. And I think the intent of the question was, you know, how, how do we really successfully coexist with these animals? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there are some ways that we can do that. Uh, very often, though, it, it's going to be specific to the site and the kind of conditions and what the actual conflict is. Um, <clears throat> we've got a wealth of experience in using water manipulation devices, and we have learned how to work with the beaver as opposed to simply eliminating the beaver. Um, we have devices that we can put in place in their dams or in places where they've attempted to block culverts <clears throat> that allow the water to continue to flow, but not to expose the beaver. And that's the key here. I think a lot of folks don't understand what the beaver is doing or why our efforts to um, <clears throat> circumvent the beaver are always futile. The, the challenge with these things is you got to find out where the lodge is. And what is the elevation of water that is necessary to maintain coverage over that opening to their lodge? If you can make some adjustments that allow for water to move and not back up, but does not fall below the level of water necessary to cover their opening, they can be quite content. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so we've got devices that will knock a hole in a dam, for example. We don't destroy it, but we'll knock a hole in it, put in a pipe or several pipes. Uh, a lot of times these things will be perforated to increase flow but we establish such that the outflow, the height of that outflow is at that same level as the, the height necessary to cover the lodge opening. Then we let the beaver rebuild the dam and they will incorporate that pipe into their device. And if they're installed properly, they cannot really figure out how to circumvent that device. It frustrates them and they respond to the sound of flowing water, uh, but there are ways that we can install it so that the water continues to flow. They will build the dam high, um, but the water will flow. Great. Um, now, there may be other cases where there really is no solution and it becomes then a challenge of you know, is there some other way to manipulate the water or do we really have to relocate the beaver? Um, that usually takes, you know, some, some expert help to, you know, fully triage the situation. Um, but in most of the stuff I deal with, we've found ways to develop coexistence um, with these devices. Um, you got to be persistent with it and it takes some homework, but it's possible. Um, Unfortunately, we've had to remove a number of beavers too. Right. You didn't have to do that. Did you see that Duck Dynasty episode where they blew up the beaver lodge? I don't know. <laughs> that, that, you don't need to do that. Don't need to do that. <clears throat> you can watch it. You can watch the you can watch them do that. 
Okay, Jim. Well, it's been a pleasure. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Again, there's Jim's contact information if you did want to reach him. If you had more questions about beavers or wanted to talk to him about some of those, we'll get some uh, the concrete examples or get those um, toxicants. A list from him for those bulls. Um, and don't forget, this is being recorded and you will get sent this also. Um, if you haven't gotten your, um, your handbook for this, the manual, that was given uh, through the mail and it should be on its way, okay? Because um, Jim mentioned that a few times that, that, that stuff was in our manual. So please just be patient if it hasn't come in the mail yet, it should be on its way. Jim, any final remarks before we sign off for the night? I don't want to hold people any longer than necessary, but uh, I certainly would be willing to answer whatever questions I can. Um, I, I will say I am not what I would consider the expert in all states because of the technicality. So as you've said many times, uh, your first line of, of contact should be the folks in your home state that really know this stuff in and out. Uh, I can talk you some generalities or, or certainly help you develop questions that you then might want to take to your, your local folks. But, uh, you know, get it right from the horse's mouth if you can. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We appreciate you coming out. And we look forward to seeing you at the next, uh, next session. Uh, on the 2nd of March, installing uh, riparian buffers. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. Thank y'all.